Want your boss to put some real action behind the rhetoric when they talk about making your workplace more inclusive? Find out how to hold their feet to the fire and demand diversity on the Diversity Dude podcast. Hello there, and welcome back to the Diversity Dude podcast. I'm your host, Lambert Fisher, marriage and family therapist, award-winning author, and national speaker on the topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. And for those of you who are interested in even more positive and encouraging tips and strategies beyond that which I offer on podcasts like this, then feel free to reach out to me at my, and check out my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, nationally recognized for the unique way in which it addresses the often difficult topic of multicultural awareness and diversity, and designed for more than just therapists, for, because if you're a helping professional in any way, diversity in clinical practice can help you meet the greatest variety of cultural needs possible for those whom you serve, and it's available in paper and audiobook versions for your convenience. And whether it be through one of my one-on-one relationship building efforts as a therapist or my informing and empowering efforts as an author and guest speaker, my personal mission is to do my part to improve the world one strengthened relationship at a time. So today I want to talk to you about a reasonable goal for affirmative action. As another election season is upon us, one of the many topics that is being talked about again is that of affirmative action. Current and aspiring political officials seeking to represent and serve various regions of this country are being tasked with either having a clear and decisive opinion on affirmative action, uh, taking a side on whether or not it should be continued, or in some cases, making actual decisions that will either help or help it continue or bring it to an end. Now, as I'm not, nor do I aspire to be a political official, I'll stay in my lane as a mental health professional and address the topic of multi of, of affirmative action from the lens of how it's often addressed on a one-on-one level in a therapeutic context. To make sure that we're thinking of the same thing, let me first make clear that I'm referring to affirmative action in the sense that it is a set of procedures, uh, policy and procedures designed to reduce the impact Uh, of past discrimination and hopefully eliminate present and future discrimination in professional environments, uh, academic environments, and more. Now, when I hear about it in a therapeutic context, it's often from various sides of the affirmative action experience. Most often it's from the experience of the person who is seeking employment, didn't get the job, and eventually found out that the person who did get the job was from one of many ethnic or other minority groups. It is then when there is a consideration of whether or not affirmative action played a part in this other person getting the job that they wanted, and as a result, they themselves did not get the job. In addition, what often follows is the feeling of resentment at the perceived unfairness of having lost out on the job due to a policy that favors some over others. Citing definitions of discrimination that refer to people being treated unfairly based on factors other than merit, they get even more upset. And... Uh, how people respond to these feelings varies. In this therapeutic context, I respond to these vulnerable expressions of feelings by first validating the frustration and resentment that can come from feeling unfairly treated. After all, everyone wants to feel as though their efforts matter and that they'll be treated according to or better than their efforts have earned. Working hard and having that effort not result in the desired outcome hurts. Not only that, but seeing someone else get what you not only want, but feel that you've earned hurts even more. Situations like this is easy to agree that help is needed. Someone or something needs to be put into place to ensure that everyone is treated fairly. And it is here where we enter into the conversation, affirmative action. For you see, it's this same feeling of frustration and resentment at apparent unfairness that motivated the creation and maintenance of affirmative action in the first place. For years, many individuals from various minority groups have experienced what it feels like to work hard for and apply for jobs or admission to universities and similar experiences and be overlooked in favor of others. Oftentimes, having felt that they've earned the right to at least have the chance to show their preparedness for the opportunity, only to see someone else seemingly less qualified get the opportunity. Not only that, but what's often seen was that the people who were chosen looked like or shared some key similarity with those who were doing the choosing, leading to the conclusion that it wasn't merit that was the deciding factor after all, rather a desire to stick with what was more comfortable because it was familiar, leaving those with different experiences and potentially beneficial contributions left on the outside. And it is here where some common misunderstandings of affirmative action become relevant. Affirmative action isn't about playing the victim 
or having an excuse not to put forth effort. Nor is it about giving people who aren't able to perform the task a handout. Nor is it about diversity for diversity's sake, making it more about arbitrary percentages instead of real life people. I similarly do not believe that people who are incapable of performing a task should get the job. However, the question then arises as to what criteria do we use to determine someone's capability or the value of their contribution? An age old employment dilemma goes like this. You need to have the experience to get the job, but you need to have the job to get the experience. Put into practice. If there's unfairness in deciding who gets the jobs, then only the same people will get the jobs and thus experience that will then turn be in turn used to justify future job opportunities. Thus, it becomes unreasonable to deny jobs based on lack of qualifications. They weren't able, given the same opportunities to earn, despite similar or even unique capabilities to do the job. If this trend is not acknowledged, then it's often unfortunately concluded that you must not be able to do the job or else you would have gotten the job in the first place. Some even broaden that sentiment and actually ask, what makes you think you can do this job? Has anyone like you ever been in a position like this before? Clearly, if they could have, they would have. So you should just focus on focus your efforts elsewhere or more lesser or more fitting positions. Sometimes the only way to remedy this is to have a policy in place that requires at least looking at, uh, actually considering, and maybe even directly hiring someone outside of one's sameness comfort zone, at least to some degree. The goal isn't to force you to be uncomfortable. The goal is to help you experience what variety, hence diversity, of skills, perspectives, and experiences can offer you in hopes that you will become less uncomfortable over time and appreciate the similarities and the differences. It's not about saying that you are wrong and other is better. Go get more of that better other. Instead, know that you can be just fine. Even the way it is can be just fine. And still you can discover that variety of experience has the opportunity to enhance what you bring to the table and create something that's even better together. You may reasonably feel that the specific ways in which affirmative action is put in place in the policy and procedure action may be imperfect. However, if you argue against it for those reasons, then please be sure to recommend an alternative solution that meets mutually beneficial needs of many, rather than going back to the way things were just because it's comfortable for some and not for others. Sometimes people even assume or even hope that the problem will solve itself, but inevitably it'll result in a return to comfort zone limiting behaviors that partially benefit some and leave others out altogether. For the decision makers listening here today, Know that it's perfectly okay to be more comfortable with those with whom you're more familiar. However, you don't have to limit your environment to only those with whom you are most familiar. There are additional life experiences and abilities and perspectives you may be missing out on simply because it might require adjustment to learning about someone else. I hope for you and everyone else listening to that is that you will be able to make the most of opportunities to branch out from your comfort zone and not only learn about the experiences of others, but that when you are in a position to do so, to welcome someone onto your team for that very reason. Not because sameness is bad, but because as the saying goes, if you only do what you've always done, you'll only get what you've always gotten. Do you and voluntarily choose to take a chance on something new. They don't have to be contradictory. I hope that you're pleasantly surprised by what you learn, not only about others, but also about yourself. And with that, I'll say thank you again for listening in to the Diversity Do podcast today. If you have any pressing diversity-related questions that you'd like me to address on an upcoming podcast, or if your organization is in need of a shame-free and empowering guest speaker or, or training on this often sensitive topic, then feel free to reach out to me directly at www.lambertsfisher.com. And if you know anyone else who can benefit from a positive and encouraging perspective on the often difficult topic of diversity, then feel free to send them a link to this podcast to be encouraged as well, or check out my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, available on Amazon.com and other booksellers. And I look forward to addressing as many topics as possible in future podcasts to help you improve as many relationships as possible at home, at work, and in the community. And as always, remember this, you don't need to know everything about everyone in order to have a positive impact on someone. Thank you all for tuning in. And have a great day. Tune in each week and find out how to demand and implement diversity at your job. 
to hear more, check out previous Diversity Dude shows on ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. Get fast, reliable internet for any budget. Now qualifying customers can get Xfinity internet free through the Affordable Connectivity Program. That's right, free high-speed internet from Xfinity. And Internet Essentials customers can get equipment included at no extra cost. Get started today. At hy we take pride in being part of the communities we serve. In 2021, we donated more than 14 million meals, and this year, we're committed to doing even more. For over 90 years, we've been the place that people turn in time of need, and we take that very seriously. That's why we're loading our semis full of food this week and making deliveries across the Midwest to help families this Easter. To join our effort, simply donate when you're at the checkout. Together, we can make a big difference for those in need. There's a new way to get around in North Minneapolis. It's Metro Transit Micro, a new ride sharing service that connects you with Metro Transit bus routes or wherever you need to go on the north side. It's convenient, affordable, and accessible. Metro Transit Micro uses minibuses to reach more neighborhoods and you'll have shorter wait times. It costs just the same as bus routes and it's easy to use. You can pay your fare in cash, a go-to card, or the Metro Transit app. Just go to metrotransit.org slash micro. Download the app and create your account. It's really simple. So whether you're going to a friend's house in Bryn Mawr to watch the Vikings game, or you need to get dropped off at the Metro Sea Line station to hop on a bus to get to work across town, Metro Transit Micro got you covered. Book a ride, get picked up, and get where you need to go. Start riding today on one of the new Metro Transit Micro minibuses. It's back to school time, and that means it's back to cooking breakfast for your kiddos and making school lunches. That's a lot of cracked egg shells and cut off sandwich crust. Now listen, before you think about throwing those food scraps away, think about recycling them. Ramsey County has a program that can help you do just that, and it won't cost you a dime. Ramsey County has a free food scraps recycling program that lets you collect stuff like apple cores, coffee grounds, and veggie scraps. Here's how it works. Put all those scraps into a compostable bag. Then once a week, drop it off at a free food scrap site by your house. And listen, I understand that life is busy, so if you can't get there once a week, just toss the bag in the freezer until you can find the time to do it. To locate a food scrap collection site near you and to get more information about the program, visit ramseyrecycles.com slash food scraps and tell your friends and family about it. Let's all do our part to help save the planet. All right, did you know I was the Mommy Slam Dunk Champion? Really? <laughs> yes, really, don't sound so surprised. Let's see it. Oh, you're ready, all right, here we go. Let's hear the crowd. <sighs> so go to right, go to left, got fake mom. Mama, go up, up, up! She did it. Again. You can't avoid gravity, but United Healthcare can help you avoid financial surprises by helping you compare costs and doctor quality ratings. United Healthcare. Uh huh.